Hello, my name is Derek Atkins, and this video lecture is entitled The Monastic Movement. This video lecture is for the Church History One class at the East Asia School of Theology. So I'm going to begin by playing a, some music for you. music that we just listened to is a type of music known as the Gregorian chant. And the Gregorian chant is one of several different types of music that were developed during the monastic movement. And so today, we're going to be looking at the monastic movement. The monastic movement is one of the great expressions of Christian spirituality. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to take a closer look at the monastic movement. We're going to look at the origins of the monastic movement. We're going to look at some of the characteristics of the monastic movement. And we're going to look at how the monastic movement has impacted our world and what contribution it made to our larger world. So let's begin by looking at the origin of the monastic movement. Now, there is some debate about when the monastic movement began. If there's some debate about the origin of the monastic movement, uh, because some people argue that the monastic movement actually began during Jewish times, that it began before the birth of Jesus. For example, um, the Qumran community was consisted of a group of Jewish ascetics who lived in the Judean Sat desert. They worked, they copied manuscripts, and they spent time in worship. Every evening they would gather together and as a group and they would worship using the same pattern as the uh, synagogue Sabbath worship. Now, just as an aside, this community is the same group of people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls were one of the most important archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. So there are those who think that the monastic movement actually had pre-Christian origins. Another forerunner of the monastic movement was something known as spiritual marriage. In spiritual marriage, Christian men and Christian women agreed to live together, but they also agreed to practice chastity. Essentially, spiritual marriage was platonic marriage. And so um, what this did was this gave Christian women uh, the protection of men, okay? And, but it freed them up, it freed them from the sexual expectations of marriage in the, that existed during the first century. Now, 
there is some, there is good reason to believe that the Apostle Paul was aware of spiritual marriage and that he had spirit, that, and it is also very probable, very likely that the Apostle Paul had spiritual marriage in mind, among other things, when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where he gives advice to Christians concerning marriage. So we see that there were definitely impulses towards some kind of monastic existence from the very beginning of Christianity. Now, in AD 313, the Edict of Milan was issued, and the Edict of Milan granted toleration to Christians throughout the Roman Empire. And so with the Edict of Milan, first the persecution of Christians ended throughout the Roman Empire, with the exception of isolated incidents. But what this meant was that after the Edict of Milan was passed, um, it became very rare for Christians to suffer martyrdom. Now, during the period of persecution, it was common for Christians to suffer martyrdom. And martyrdom came to be viewed as an expression of one's devotion to Christ, because this was, you know, you were willing to give up your life for, for the faith. But with the Edict of Milan, that was no longer the case. Christians were not being persecuted anymore. So Christians were not being martyred anymore. And so, but there were still Christians who wanted to find other ways to express their devotion to God. And so, as a result, some Christians began practicing monasticism as a way to express their devotion towards God, as a way to grow closer to God. In fact, monasticism became known as the white martyrdom, and monks and nuns became viewed at, came to be seen as spiritual martyrs. They were being martyrs, but not in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. They were practicing white martyrdom in contrast to the red martyrdom of giving one's life and shedding one's blood for the faith during times of persecution. Now, there are two different types of monastic life. The first type of monastic life is the eremitic life. This is the individual monastic life. Um, in the Aramidic life, monks, um, individual monks, seek out places of solitude. And they do this so that they can draw closer to God and spend their time in prayer and meditation. Um, but what's important to note is that when these individual monks sought out solitude, when they left society, their departure from society was always for the purpose and with the intention of returning to society after a time of solitude. Um, so the idea was that this time of solitude was actually a time of preparation when the individual monk or nun drew close to God and um, grew in their relationship with God so that when they did return to society, they would be better equipped to serve God and their brothers and sisters in society. So that's the Aramidic um, aspect of monasticism. The other kind of monasticism is known as Cenobitic monasticism. This is monasticism that is practiced within a community. Uh, because as time went by, monks began to gather together and began to live together in community. 
Now, in, in the communal monastic life, monks um, center their lives around work, prayer, and worship. So monks, um, when monks live in community, they do a wide variety of different jobs and chores. Um, these monks um, do jobs such as preparing food, tending to animals, um, mending and making clothes, preparing medicine, and so forth. But monks also spend their time in prayer. Uh, monks are encouraged to pray without ceasing. So this means that as they go about their daily chores, monks are encouraged to pray while they work. Or if they are traveling from one place to another, they are encouraged to pray while they are on their journey, while they are traveling. So, and so this way they can uh, practice constant communion with God. In addition to all of this, monks would gather together as a community throughout the day at set times during the day. In fact, they would gather together seven times each day. And when they gathered together, they would gather together for a time of prayer and worship. Uh, and so this meant that throughout the day, um, woven into the pattern of their daily living was this habit of prayer and meditation. It was just woven into their lives. And it was believed that this practice of work, prayer, and worship would help monks to grow closer in their relationship, grow closer to God in their and mature in their relationship with God. Um, now, one other aspect of the monastic, uh, communal monastic life was that uh, most monasteries will go through the, will sing the entire psalm once every week. And so this is what you find in many monasteries around the world is these monks are singing through the entire song every week. And so this is one of the reasons why the book of Psalms has become known as the church's song book or the church's book of poetry. It's because of this practice that monks have of going through the entire psalm every week. Now, let's look a little bit more at the history of the monastic movement. So monasticism um, began with individual monks going out into the desert. Many of these monks were, became known as the Desert Fathers. Now, um, they would do this in, not because they wanted to go to barren places, but because they wanted to find places of solitude where they could escape the distractions of the world and be able to focus completely on God in prayer and meditation. St. Anthony the Great is traditionally credited as being the father of the monastic movement. Um, it is probably not likely that Anthony really was the very first Christian monk, but his life does illustrate the monastic ideal. Athanasius of Alexandria popularized Anthony's life with his book, by, with his biography of St. Anthony. This biography was known as The Life of Anthony. And as a result, this book came to popularize not only St. Anthony's life, but the monastic ideal. 
And so many Christians read this book and they were inspired to imitate St. Anthony. And so Christian monks and nuns began going out into the desert. And um, many of them would go into the desert in Syria and Egypt. Um, now, um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, when Christian monks went out to seek places of solitude, they always did so with the intention of returning to society. And this is something that we see in St. Anthony's life, because every he, he would go out into the desert, but he always returned to society. And he went through this cycle several times. He went into the out into the desert several times, but he always returned to society again and again so that he could um, so that he could provide help to his fellow monks and to his fellow brothers and sister Christians who were then living in a society that was still very much dominated by pagan beliefs and pagan practices. But as time went by, these individual monks began to um, come together to live in monastic communities. And Pachomius is believed to be the father of the Cenobitic monastic life. That is the father of monastic communities. And he is believed to have established the first monastic community sometime between AD 318 and 323. And his community was located somewhere in the Egyptian desert. Eventually, his monastery uh, would have more than 100 monks. And so Pachomius is considered the father of the monastic community. Now, one of the great struggles that monks um, struggled with was the stroke, the sin of anger. Now, for those of us who live today, this might seem a strange struggle to us because for many of us today, we might think, oh, the greatest struggle they would have had would have been sexual temptation because they were not, the, and so this, but this idea, this misunderstanding is the result of our, of the society that we live in today, where we are surrounded by sexual stimuli, where we are surrounded by um, just all this exposure to sex and advertisement and so forth. But for the Desert Fathers and for the early monks and nuns, their great struggle was mastering one's anger. Because what they believed was that if, um, if they gave in to anger, that was a sign uh, that they lacked self-control. They also believed that anger could lead to other sins. And so the great struggle they wrestled with was learning how to control their own anger. Now, as time went by, uh, these monastic communities came to realize that they needed rules to govern their lives together. Uh, they needed rules to organize their days they needed rules to govern their relationships with one another. And so many monasteries began developing their own rules, their own rules for conduct, their own rules for living out the monastic life. Um, but eventually the rule of Benedict became the dominant rule for the majority of monasteries and nunneries in the Western tradition. 
And the rule of Benedict was uh, put together by Benedict of Nursia in AD 516. Now, Benedict did not actually write these rules. Instead, what he did was he gathered together rules from all these different rules that existed out there. And so he gathered them together and that's how he came up with the rule of Benedict. Now, even though Benedict did not write these rules, he did select which rules to include in the rule of St. Benedict. And so by choosing these rules, by choosing which rules to include in his own rule and which rules to not include, we can see what concerns were important to him. We can see what matters uh, he thought were really important. Now, Benedict also came up with a metaphor for the monastic life. Um, he came up with a metaphor for how monks should grow in their Christian, in their in the Christian faith. And this metaphor, he, he borrowed a met he, this metaphor that he used came from Genesis 28, where um, Jacob has a dream, and in his dream he sees a ladder going from earth to heaven, and he sees angels descending and ascending on this ladder, Jacob's ladder. And so, um, but what, what Benedict did was he took this metaphor and he argued that uh, this ladder represented the different stages of growth in one Christian life. He came up with a 12-step program or 12 steps that Christians should go through in their Christian growth. And so each step focused on a different virtue. And as Christians progress through these virtues, they would grow in their relationship with God and they would grow in their Christian character and they would become more and more Christ-like. Now, Two key virtues that uh, were emphasized in the monastic life were the virtues of humility and obedience. Now, I wrote silence here because silence was considered part of that virtue of humility. Um, the reason that silence was emphasized so much in some monastic communities is because they, they viewed um, talking too much as a sign of lack of self-control. They also saw it as a sign of pride, because if you talk too much, that was evidence that you had too much self-regard, that you thought too highly of yourself. So this is why silence was so important in monastic communities, because it was seen as part of the virtue of humility. Another key virtue that was um, cultivated within monastic communities was the virtue of obedience, especially obedience to one's um, abbot or abbess. Um, now, it was recognized that this was not an easy virtue to practice because it is so easy for one's own will to get in the way. And so they really emphasize obedience, especially to one, to the leader of one's community. And this is why monks and nuns were urged to regard their abbot or abbess as if that person were Christ himself. So, they were to obey their abbot or abbess as if that, as if their abbot, abbot or abbess was Christ himself. This is how seriously they took the virtue of obedience. Now, the um, as I said earlier, 
the monastic life centered on the practices of work, prayer, and worship. And this came to be summarized in a slogan, in the slogan, Ora et Labora. Um, Ora et Labora is a Latin phrase that means prayer and work. So this phrase, ora et labora, emphasized that monks were to focus on prayer and work and worship. And as they did this, this would equip them to um, better love God and to better love their neighbor. Now, let's talk about the contribution that the monastic movement has made to the world. The monastic movement has made some tremendous contributions to the world. So the very first contribution I want to talk about is the preservation of knowledge. Um, with the fall of the Roman Empire in the 400s, um, all of the ancient knowledge that had been a gathered by the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans were in very real danger of completely disappearing. And if that had happened, that would have been a huge loss for the entire world. Thankfully, monasteries set about uh, preserving this knowledge of the ancients. Uh, monks uh, copied not only the Bible, but they also copied the ancient manuscripts of different scholars from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And by doing this, they were able to preserve knowledge. They were able to preserve the knowledge of the ancient, of the ancient scholars in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Um, and so because of this, uh, monasteries became centers of learning. Now, um, one person, one famous monk is Saint Jerome. He, um, he lived as a monk in Bethlehem for a number of years. And while he was in Bethlehem, he spent time translating the Bible from the original Hebrew and Greek into Latin. And this is where we get the Latin Vulgate Bible from. It was translated by this man, St. Jerome. And so St. Jerome's work was part of this effort to preserve the knowledge of the ancients. And that also included preserving the Bible so that future generations would have access to the Bible. Now, because monasteries began to preserve knowledge, monasteries became uh, major centers of learning. And so this naturally led to monasteries becoming involved in education. Uh, many monasteries established schools and they would, um, monks and nuns would educate the children of local communities. Um, and so this is another great service that the monasteries provided to their communities. Now, we know that for many, for hundreds of years, education was limited to a uh, privileged few. But even though education was limited to a privileged few, the truth is these monasteries were very very much involved in the work of education. And even today, monks and nuns are heavily involved in education throughout the world. So this is another great contribution that the monastic movement has made to our world. Another way, another way that the monastic movement has impacted Christianity and the larger world is through the missionary movement. Um, 
It may surprise you to know that from AD 400 to AD 16, to 1600, um, the vast majority of Christian missionaries were monks. It's true. The vast majority of missionaries from AD 400 to 1600 were monks. For example, St. Patrick um, was a monk who helped evangelize Ireland. Cyril and Methodius were two Orthodox monks who took the gospel to the Slavic people, especially to the people of Bulgaria and Russia. And one of the things they did in their missionary work was to create a completely new alphabet, what, what is today known as the Cyrillic alphabet. And the reason why they created this alphabet was because the Slavic languages at that time had no written language. They were just strictly spoken languages. And so Cyril and Methodius created the Cyrillic alphabet. And this alphabet is used today in Russia and in other Slavic countries. Matteo Ricci was another famous missionary monk. He went to China, and when and when he was in China, he practiced um, contextualization. Um, he was a he, he helped actually in some ways, he helped pioneer the practice of contextualization. He dressed as a Confucian Mandarin and he adopted different um, habits of Confucian Mandarin. And he did this because he thought that this would be a way that he could connect with the Confucian Mandarin in China and that he he thought that this way, by doing this, that this would open the door for the Confucian Mandarins in China to hear the gospel and to accept the gospel. Francis Xavier was another famous missionary monk. Now, he was a Jesuit monk. He was with the Jesuits, and he did mission work in India and Southeast Asia. But he is most known for being the first Christian missionary to enter Japan. And so he was the first Christian to take the gospel into Japan. And so he helped lay the foundation for the Christian church in Japan. Now, he later um, tried to enter China, and he died on an island while waiting to enter China. But he is another one of these famous missionary monks. And in our future, in some of our future lectures, we will look in more detail at some of these missionary monks. Now, another area where um, the monastic movement made huge contributions to the world was in the area of science. Now, today, we often hear this idea that science and religion have always been at war with each other. That is a lie. Because the reality is that in many ways, science, modern science, actually um, grew on the foundation of Christian theology. And not only that, but many Christians have been famous scientists um, throughout history, including many Christian monks. For example, William of Ockham was a Christian monk who lived during the medieval time. And he came up with a statement that became known as Ockham's Razor. And this statement says, all things being equal, the simplest solution tends to be the best one. And so what and so this became a test for evaluating different hypotheses or different theories about to explain what scientists were observing in nature. 
So even today, when scientists observe things in nature and they try to explain what they're observing, many of them still use the test of Occam's razor to evaluate or to judge whether their theories or their explanations are good explanations or not. So that's the contribution that Occam, William of Occam has made to the world of science. Another monk named Roger Bacon, Bacon made other important contributions to science. Um, when you were in primary school, middle school, and high school, you probably learned about the scientific method. You learned about the different steps that scientists go through when they practice science. You know, you learn about how scientists will observe things, they'll ask questions, then they'll formulate a hypothesis or theory um, that explains what they're observing, and then they will conduct experiments to um, confirm or deny these um, explanations or these theories. And then after they are able to confirm or deny their ideas, then they can, um, can modify what, they, what their theories are, make corrections, and then the cycle starts all over again. So that's the scientific method. And Roger Bacon is one of the people who helped develop the scientific method. And so he made a, a very important contribution to, um, to the world of science. And he was another monk who lived during the Middle Ages. Jesuits um, helped pioneer the study of earthquakes. In fact, Thomas E. Wood Jr. writes, Jesuits so dominated the study of earthquakes that seismology became known as the Jesuit science. So these Jesuit monks who pioneered the study of earthquakes helped lay the foundation for modern for the modern study of earthquakes. And so this is another contribution that the monastic movement has made to the scientific world. In addition, um, Gregor Mendel was a friar who lived um, later. He lived in the 1800s and um, he did work with peas. He worked with different plants and he studied heredity. And his studies in heredity helped lay the foundation for the science of genetics. So he made, this was another monk, actually a friar, who made a very important contribution to the world of science. So this is, these are some of the contributions that monks have made to the world of science. There are many other monks who have also been involved in science. Now, another area where the monastic movement has made tremendous contributions to the world is in the area of art. Um, monks, as I said earlier, spent much of their time copying the Bible. And as they copied the Bible, some monks began painting pictures in them, drawing pictures or painting pictures in them. And some of these pictures became some of these illustrations became very elaborate and very beautiful and vivid. And in fact, there is a special type of Bible known as the illuminated Bible that were created by monks. And these illuminated Bibles include pictures that illustrate different Bible stories or different Bible passages. And sometimes they also have elaborate artwork in the margin of the pages. So if you look on this slide, the picture on the left of this slide it is a picture of a page from one of these illuminated Bibles. And so you can see how beautiful these Bibles were. Now, another area where monks 
help where the monastic movement uh, contributed to the world of art was in the area of stained glass windows. Now, monks didn't, were not the first ones to um, invent stained glass windows. They did not invent stained glass windows. But monasteries were, were the earliest Christian buildings to include stained glass windows. So even though monks did not invent stained glass windows, they certainly gave an avenue for stained glass windows to be displayed. And, and of course, this went on to stained glass windows, went on to be found not only in monasteries, but also in churches. In addition to all of this, um, monasteries also included paintings, mosaics, and tapestries. And so this gave other artists more opportunities to practice their artwork and to uh, contribute to the, um, the treasury, the, the, the artistic treasure of Western civilization. And in addition to all of this, um, monasteries also, mon monasteries and nunneries also contributed to architecture because monasteries and nunneries were built using a wide variety of different architectural styles. And so this also contributed to the architectural um, treasure of Western civilization. Now, I have some discussion questions for you. And I want you to encourage you to think about these discussion questions because we will talk about these discussion questions when we meet in class. So here are three discussion questions I want you to think about. Number one, do you think a biblical case can be made for monasticism? Number two, what are some pluses and minuses of living a monastic life? And number three, what do you think Protestants can learn from the monastic movement? So I want to encourage you to think about these questions and to come to class ready to discuss these questions. 